Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in a new series that we have begun, and I've titled it Studies in Jeremiah because we're not going through it chapter by chapter. We're gonna, I'm just taking select passages, and last week, which was the first lesson in our studies, we dealt with chapter 1. This morning, we're going to look at chapter 4. And it's a broader context than just chapter 4, but that's the central chapter that we will look at. So I'm going to not read the entire chapter. I'm going to read the first four verses. I think they capture the the heart of what we're going to study this morning. But Jeremiah chapter 4, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detested things from my presence and not waver, and you will swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. I want to just make a brief comment about that because I'm not going to deal really with uh, chapter 2 and the second, at least the second part of that verse. Uh, but I think that's a prophecy of what is to come. And what he's saying is, if you will believe, and they're in unbelief when he's speaking to this nation, if you will do that, or when you do that, then the nations are going to bless themselves in him. They are going to glory him in him. And that's really a prophecy that um, Paul deals with in Romans 11. He speaks of that in Romans 11, verse 12, explaining to the Gentiles what's happened. Because of Israel's unbelief, they have been brought in and grafted into the olive tree. But he says, now, if their unbelief meant blessing for you, the nations, think of what their fullness will mean when they are brought to saving faith in Christ, which he goes on to speak of in that chapter. It will mean blessing, great blessing for the entire world. I think that's what he's speaking of here. And this is one of the themes that we will see all through the book of Jeremiah. We'll see it a little bit in chapter 3 as I refer to it. But one of the many themes in the book of Jeremiah is the great theme of Israel's restoration and the coming blessings on the world because of it. So that will happen, but what is required, and what we see a focus of here in this chapter, is repentance. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. There again, we have another theme, a theme of judgment that runs through this great book. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our passage this morning is Jeremiah 4. And our subject is repentance. But this is only part of a a larger passage made up of chapters 1 through 6 with a number of subjects. In fact, these six chapters have been compared to a musical symphony. Because like a symphony, they have recurring themes. Symphonies even tell a story. Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, for example, the pastoral begins in the countryside, it's pleasant, then a storm arises, it breaks, then passes, and there's peace again. Chapters 1 through 6 of Jeremiah have similar themes, but mostly it is a storm. Idolatry was a problem for God's people, so Jeremiah was sent to tell them to repent or judgment would come. That's the subject of chapter 4, which we will mainly look at in this um, sixth 
chapter symphony. It's about God's ancient people, but it has lessons for the modern church. Idolatry is not a thing of the past. We have idols too, and we too are in need of repentance. We're always in need of examining ourselves and turning away from what the book of Hebrews describes as the sin which so easily entangles us. And Israel gives us an object lesson for that. It was entangled in sin, entangled in idolatry. So Jeremiah was to warn of the storm that was on the horizon, of judgment coming, and of the need to change. Chapter 3 begins that way with the nation's sin and the prophet's plea for the nation to repent. Like Hosea, Jeremiah likened the people to an unfaithful wife. It's serious. God's great love for his people, his unconditional love for his people was violated. It was rejected. And that is serious. And this is true of both the northern and southern kingdoms. In verses 6 through 11 of chapter 3, Jeremiah calls them two sisters, faithless Israel and treacherous Judah. And you'll remember that after the golden age of Solomon, the nation divided. Ten tribes formed the nation of Israel in the north, while two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, formed the nation of Judah in the south. Israel, the north, Become, became unfaithful immediately with its first king, Jeroboam, when he made two golden calves and set one up at Bethel in the south on the southern border and then the second at Dan on the northern border. border. Um, eventually, after many years and many kings, God's patience ran out with Israel and in the year 722 B.C., he brought the Assyrian army against them. Israel was defeated, it was deported, and it ceased to be, it ceased to exist. But in spite of Israel's sin and its removal from the land, its diaspora among the Gentiles, God gave the nation a gracious promise, a gracious invitation to return. In verse 12 of chapter 3, God told Jeremiah to say, Return, faithless Israel, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Then he gave the promise that he will bring them back to Zion. He will send shepherds to them who would feed them knowledge and understanding. And what he's saying there is the nation in the future will believe. And that will include the southern kingdom of Judah. Treacherous Judah, as he calls them, will be restored. The house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. I call that a prophecy. I think it is, because that has not happened yet. This is a promise, but it's not yet happened. So this is a prophecy yet to be fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled as Paul speaks of it in Romans 11, verse 26, when he says, all Israel will be saved. It will be in the messianic age. It will occur in the millennial kingdom. And that's a great hope. And it's a certain hope. We know what history is going toward. But it will happen through repentance. That's the meaning of Jeremiah's message. Return faithless Israel. There's no blessing without repentance. Again, that's our subject. So... What is repentance? It's an important question and one worth considering for a moment. Very simply, repentance is a change of mind. That's literally the meaning of the Greek word in the New Testament, metanoia. It's two words, meta, after, noia, mind. So it's new thinking that comes after a change. It occurs when a person recognizes that an earlier idea or um, practice is foolish or improper or evil, and he or she changes his or her mind about it. So they turn from the old thought 
to the new one, from the bad to the good. In the Old Testament, repentance is literally turn. It's the Hebrew word shuv. It's a common word. Translated here as return, but the meaning is simply turn. As in turning from sin or error. That's repentance. It is a turning of the heart to the light from the darkness. A person repents when in faith he or she responds to the truth and turns away from falsehood, turns away from evil practices. Repentance can't be separated from faith. They go together and occur at the same time. When we turn to Christ for salvation, we simultaneously turn from error, turn from idols, turn from indifference or unbelief. Repentance and faith are two different aspects of the same event, which is conversion. We can think of them as two sides of the same coin, one negative, one positive, that can't be separated. So repentance, like faith, is part of conversion. But just as a converted person continues to believe... That's the Christian life. It's the life of faith. It's the life of continually believing. So too, a converted person continues to repent. But this is how it begins. It, the new life that we have in Christ begins with faith and repentance. It's our obligation. It's our human responsibility. Still, it is a work of grace. It is that for us today, and it was that for Judah as well. Jeremiah certainly understood that. He preached repentance. That was his message to the nation, to turn from idols and back to the Lord. But he knew a human heart could do that only when God first acts upon it and when God brings spiritual healing. Jeremiah understood human nature. He understood the nature of the heart. If you want to understand the human condition, if you want to understand the soul, don't read Freud. Read Jeremiah. What is maybe the most insightful and damning analysis of the mind and heart, and those, both, those two are the same, is given by Jeremiah later in chapter 17 and verse 9 where he says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. And then he asks, who can understand it? Well, the answer to that question is no one. We deceive ourselves into thinking we're okay when we're not. Right with God and man when we're really at war. We are not capable of honestly and rightly understanding ourselves. That's the human heart, naturally. That's the human heart apart from the healing work of the Lord God. Only the Lord God can heal and bring us to repentance. Later in chapter 31, which is the great chapter of grace in this book, the chapter about the new covenant, Jeremiah says in verse 18, Bring me back that I may be restored. Now you see there, he needs to be restored, he says, but I can only be restored if you bring me back. Literally, that statement is, Turn me and I shall be turned. Lord, I need to be turned, but you must turn me. He recognizes repentance is a sovereign work of God. And here in chapter 3, Jeremiah prophesied that the future repentance and salvation of Israel, that's a certainty, it's a prophecy, but in his day, in Jeremiah's day, there was only hardness of heart. So Jeremiah had a difficult ministry. We talked about that last week. A long ministry and a difficult ministry, and he would get discouraged in it. He was preaching to a hard-hearted people. Nevertheless, he did it. He would get discouraged, but he would continue on. He would continue preaching because God told him to do that. That was his commission. He had no other option before him. He had to continue bringing light 
to that nation. And he did it not only to because, because he was obedient, but because he knew in his love for the nation that it was only through preaching, it was only through the scriptures and bringing them to the people that their hearts would change because that's how God changes hearts. It's through the preaching of the Word of God. It's through the reading and the teaching of the Word of God. Well, that brings us to chapter 4 and Jeremiah's sermon where he begins again with a call to repentance. It's given in two parts. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, he explains the way of true repentance. If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. In other words, there's only one direction of repentance, and that is turning to the Lord God, the only true God. But that meant leaving the false gods. That meant leaving their idols, their old life. And so the Lord says, you will put away your detested things from my presence. In other words, they have to abandon those idols that they cherish so much. They can't have a divided heart. There's no fellowship between light and darkness. And idols are darkness. Idols are error. They're false. And God will not share His glory with another. He says that in Isaiah 42, verse 8. Repentance is turning from that. It's turning from error by turning to truth. Now there's something in that, I think, for the church today because the evangelical church is enamored of the world and its way of doing things, its pattern for success. And so... It's not uncommon today for churches to adopt business models as the pattern for running the church. They've elevated the minister to the position of leader. In fact, they even call him the CEO. I've, I've read that in places. I don't want to sound like I'm being very critical of the modern church. I haven't been to all the churches, so I'm not in a position to do that. But the things I hear about are consistent with this. Business models are good for businesses, but the church isn't a business. It's the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the church, not a single man. We're to look to Him. We're to look to the Lord in prayer. We're to study His Word. We're to wait on Him and, and follow the simple pattern that is given to us in the New Testament. And... As we faithfully do that, as we study and as we look to the Lord in prayer, as we wait upon Him, we'll have the success that the Lord wants for us. I think that's what we need to do. That's being faithful to our commission. Well, that's the church in a kind of larger sense, but of course, more fundamentally, this occurs this problem of the world and, and believers occurs in the personal lives of Christians. We, we let the world into our lives. Fifty years ago, I heard the expression, e easygoing evangelicalism. It stuck with me. I don't think it's changed much in a, much in a half century. Professing Christians have a casual acquaintance with the Bible, aren't much interested in knowing God and give little thought to Him and holiness. The world seeps into the heart and becomes an idol. It's very subtle, but it happens. And, and we're all guilty of that to some extent. It's hard not to be. We're surrounded by the world. It's, it's pressure to conform is constant. We can't escape it. But we can be aware of it. And when we see it, we can confess it and we can turn from it. That was Israel and Judah. They conformed to the world of their day. They adopted the worldview of the pagans and embraced the world's gods. So Jeremiah called the nation to repent. And in verses 3 and 4, he vividly pictures repentance as plowing up their lives and circumcising their hearts. Break up your fallow ground, he says, and do not sow among the thorns. Hosea had said that 
to the northern kingdom in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Now, Jeremiah, who was clearly a, a student of Hosea, says to the south, break up your fallow ground. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know how hard and rocky the ground is. But that pictures the heart of the people of Judah. Their unbelief and idolatry, their, their love of the world had made their hearts like rocky soil. And so they needed to break it up. They needed to remove that hard exterior of unbelief. And Jeremiah adds, not so among thorns. When the ground is left fallow, left alone, unplanted, unattended, it's not left without growth. Things grow, undesirable things like weeds and thorns. And the ground of the hearts of this people had been neglected and be had become overgrown with thorns. What the Apostle Paul calls in Galatians 5.19, the deeds of the flesh. And Paul told the Galatians, whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. If you sow to the flesh and ignore the Spirit, if you so to thorns, if you plant thorns, you'll get thorns. You'll get trouble and pain and regrets and disobedience. That's what Je Jeremiah was warning of. He continues, continues doing that in verse 4 with a, a different picture when he, calls, when he tells them to circumcise their hearts, do some spiritual surgery on themselves. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant between God and man, specifically between God and, and the people of Israel. God gave the sign to Abraham, and it was commanded under the old covenant. Every male child on the eighth day was to be circumcised. It, it signified that the people belonged to the Lord, had this constant reminder of that, of that covenant. But it was never intended as merely an outward sign. It was intended to witness to an inward reality. Moses recognized that early on. He saw the problem that, that Jeremiah addresses here. And, and in Deuteronomy, Moses twice gave this command to circumcise their heart. The heart is a, a person's inner life. The place of the intellect the will, it's the source, the origin of, of purposeful action. The heart is where decisions are made. It's where the spiritual life occurs. And so an uncircumcised heart was an unconsecrated heart, an unbelieving mind, and a disobedient life. That's what the people were. The people of Jeremiah's day were that, unbelieving, disobedient. But they thought they were okay. After all, they had the sign of God's covenant in their flesh. They'd shed blood in obtaining that sign. And certainly, having that sign made them right with God. People think that. I've been baptized. Surely I'm right with God. I come to church. I na my name's on the roll. Surely I'm right with God. Well, circumcision didn't make the nation right with God. But then remember, the heart is deceitful. We fool ourselves. That's what Jeremiah was telling them. He was calling the people to a real consecration Dedication to the Lord to become truly His people, not in name only, but in spirit as well. That's repentance. But as the years passed, it would be clear that the nation wasn't listening and only became more hardened in its resistance to the Lord and His prophet, making judgment inevitable. That's the reason Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And the reason judgment is the emphasis of the rest of the prophecy from verse 5 of chapter 4 through the end of chapter 6. 
In verses 5 and 6, Jeremiah sounds the alarm. Blow the trumpet in the land, he says. Verse 6, seek refuge, do not stand still, for I am bringing evil from the north. Later in chapter 6 and verse 1, he gives uh, the warning that evil looks down from the north. It will come, he says, at the end of the chapter, uh, the end of chapter 6, with uh, bows and spears, and they will have no mercy. Well, the evil he's describing, this evil from the north, is Babylon. He describes its army as a lion, a destroyer of nations. That's a description that was quite appropriate along the processional way of the ancient city of Babylon that led through the Ishtar Gate through which the captives of Judah would pass were representations of lions in colorful enamel. They are depicted as roaring and fierce, the very kind of representation of frightening power that Nebuchadnezzar wanted of himself. This was the evil that God would bring down on his recalcitrant, stiff-necked people. Jeremiah said that the lion would make Judah's city a waste, ruins without inhabitants. Toward the end of the chapter, chapter 4, in verses 23 through 26, he describes the, the ruin that this judgment would bring on the land. And he describes it in a very interesting way. It harkens back to Genesis chapter 1. Because he describes it as being like the undoing of creation. In Genesis 1, the world begins covered in water, covered in darkness, it's chaos and lifeless, and God brings order and life out of that. Well, here Jeremiah describes the opposite. Order descends into chaos and lifelessness. He said he looked on the earth and it was formless and void. Well, he, that comes from Genesis 1. The land that was fruitful, he says, was a wilderness. And it was all deserved. This judgment was brought on the people by the people themselves. Jeremiah reminds them of that in verse 18. Your ways and your deeds have brought these things to you. They did not repent. And this came upon them. But what's described here early in Jeremiah's ministry wouldn't come until the very end toward the end of his 40-year ministry. So, all through this book, we read of the prophet preaching repentance, warning of the judgment, but the people turning not to the Lord, but away from Him. In Exodus 34, the Lord defines Himself as compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. But He is also just, and he must deal with his people justly, which ultimately means in judgment. Now again, Israel is an object lesson for us. We can learn from their problem, which was idolatry. We can, we can learn from the consequences, which is judgment. And we can learn from the solution, which is repentance. The problem of idolatry is not only ancient. As I said earlier, it is with us today. It's always been man's problem in one way or another, and so it is an ongoing issue. John Calvin recognized that in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. He made the oft-quoted statement describing the human heart as a perpetual idol factory. Jeremiah's contemporary Ezekiel said something similar in Ezekiel chapter 14, that the men of his day have taken their idols into their hearts. Well, that's the, the real scene of idolatry. It may take place in a temple somewhere, but really where it's going on ultimately, fundamentally, is in the human heart. 
Calvin was right. The, the heart is an idol factory. And while Calvin and Jeremiah and Ezekiel were talking of the natural man, speaking of the unbeliever, it is a problem for the genuine child of God as well. That's the reason the Apostle John ended his first epistle, ended the book of 1 John with the admonition, the warning to the church, the warning to believers, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now that means more than don't go back to that old life and the pagan temple. That, that would not be enough. That could even lead to self-deception. I mean, a person could say, well, I'm okay. I, I don't go to the temple of Aphrodite anymore. Well, no, your feet don't carry you there, but your heart is open to all kinds of things. And that's what John is speaking of here. Guard your hearts. Don't allow the world in. Don't allow materialism or pride or ambition, selfish ambition. It's not wrong to have, uh, be ambitious in what you're doing and seeking ambitiously to glorify God. But selfish ambition or worldliness, don't let those get a foothold in your heart and build a shrine there. That happens to us. Sin takes root in our heart. It's what the author of Hebrews warned of in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where he wrote of the sin which so easily entangles us. Now, he didn't define that sin because it's different for everyone. But it becomes an idol when we allow ourselves to be entangled in it. That happens when, when sin takes hold in our heart. We sow to thorns. And the pressure's on. Always. Again, the world is all around us and we can't escape it. And it's always pressing us to conform like the Lorelei, the cliff on the Rhine River where a beautiful girl sat combing her golden hair. That's the story. Maybe you've been there. It's a scenic spot, the river bends around this great promontory, this great rock that juts out into the water, and there she sat singing a seductive song that lured boatmen to their destruction. It's a myth, of course, but there's a truth in it, and the truth is that's the world. It's a lie. It's a siren song, beautiful, one that attracts us but leads to wreck and ruin. That's what Paul warns of in Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. John said, guard yourselves from idols. We all need to do that. To be aware and on guard and repent. As long as there is sin in us, and there will be sin in us to the day we die. Paul speaks of it in Romans 7. He talks about the law of sin in his members. It's always there and always active. As long as we are alive in this world, we will need to repent daily. We need to always be breaking up the fallow ground of our heart. And that, I think, is the application of this passage to our daily lives, to our daily walk with the Lord but not the only one. In fact, the most effective way to empty our hearts of idols and error is by filling them with the Lord. I often quote this, I know, the title of Thomas Chalmers' little book, but I do so because I think he nailed it. The expulsive power of a new affection. That's what brings change. It's a small book. You can get it uh, from Amazon. It's, uh, what, about 150 years old. You can even get it, I think, just on the Internet. And he develops it very beautifully, profoundly, I think. But what he says in that book is really stated completely in the title of the book, The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. 
The new affection is the knowledge of our Lord, of who He is and, and what He's done. That's what produces this affection of love for Him. The knowledge of His sacrifice, of His love for us, His, His grace, sovereign grace. That's the power that expels all rivals to Him. The, the power of the positive is always greater than the negative. That's why the author of Hebrews tells us to run the spiritual race of faith by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Fill your minds with Him. That's how we are transformed, as Paul puts it in Romans 12, by the renewing of our minds. It's by the knowledge of God, the whole range of doctrine, because that's the gateway to a relationship with Him. Knowing about Him in order to know Him. Doctrine isn't the goal. It isn't the end of everything. When it becomes that, it leads to pride, it leads to coldness. Knowledge, though, precise knowledge, is necessary. Because it's the means to knowing the Lord personally. That's our goal. Let me know your ways, Moses prayed, that I may know you. And as we reflect on him and all that he's done for us, given us a new mind, I'm talking to believers when I say that, delivered us from the deceitful heart, forgiven us completely, given us new life and a glorious future, that he has adopted us, strangers, aliens, Rebels adopted us into his family and loves us now and always unconditionally, relentlessly. When we reflect on that, that it's all of grace, again, sovereign grace, that gifts us with enlightened minds, the, the faith and repentance to respond to God's word and the gospel, then we see reality. Then we see that we are debtors to mercy alone. Rich beyond imagination, but debtors to His mercy. And the more we do that, the more it expands in our thinking, the more it affects our desires and gives us new loves and purer longings, and, and it acts as the expulsive power that it is, and it, it pushes out the idols. That's when repentance, turning, becomes genuine. Repentance is not something that we must muster up. It's not something we force ourselves to do in a kind of grim, joyless life. This is what we want to do, and we want to do it because of our love for Him. So to have genuine repentance, we need to fill our hearts with the knowledge of the Lord and, and a walk with Him and a love for Him. Now, I don't want to seem simplistic in what I'm saying. The race of faith is long. It is hard. We stumble along the way. We have setbacks. That's true. That's the reality. Still, that's the true path. Looking to Christ, filling our mind with Him, the expulsive power of a new affection. And over time, we are transformed. It's a lifetime effort, and it does take effort. It takes discipline. It comes with study. Study, important. And with fellowship with the saints, genuine fellowship, serving and encouraging one another. The heart is still deceitful. We still have a heart that needs to be sanctified, and it's being sanctified, but it is still deceitful. We drift spiritually. When we do, we need the saints to admonish us, to warn us, and we need the scriptures to correct us. Or the Lord Himself will correct us. He'll discipline us. We see that here with His treatment of Israel. But He disciplines us as a father disciplines a son. Proverbs chapter 3. He disciplines us for a good purpose and out of love. All of this, I think, is the application of this passage in Jeremiah to our lives. But also, 
and principally, he is preaching to a hard-hearted generation that was in unbelief, that had a false security because of circumcision, like some people do today with a false security because of baptism or associations they have. This nation was in unbelief that he spoke to. It was unsaved. It was lost. They were so lost they didn't even know it. And his message was, break up your fallow ground, your hard hearts. Repent. Turn away from the idols and, the only, and to the only true God, the Lord himself. Turn because it's for your good. Turn because it's right. Turn before the judgment comes. Well, that turning, that repentance is a gift of God. We must do it. They must do it. But we cannot and they could not do it of ourselves or of themselves. We must look to the Lord in prayer and beseech Him. Turn me and I shall be turned. But turn me. He's a merciful God. He hears our prayers. If you've not believed in Christ for salvation, if you are hanging on to unbelief, if you're hanging on to some idol, maybe it's the idol of self-love, the message of Jeremiah to you is repent. Know that you're lost and the judgment is coming. That's a certainty. And that judgment is eternal. It's forever the outer darkness. Turn from error and turn to Christ, God's Son, who took our place in judgment when He died for sinners. Turn to Him. Come to Him. He receives all who do. But God help you to do that. And help all of us who've done that to keep looking to Christ and filling our hearts and our minds with Him. Living a life that's pleasing. Well, let's... Stand and conclude our service with hymn number 27 in the Songs of Praise book. Hymn number 27, Pensive, Doubting, Fearful Heart. Great hymn from John Newton. And then remain standing for the benediction. Father, we have great confidence in what the God of love can do. And... You do rebuild lives and you transform us as we look to you and walk faithfully with you. I pray that you would bless each of us with that desire and, and that accomplished life. May we walk with you and fill our hearts with the knowledge of you and turn from things that are harmful and that are kind of works of unbelief, thorns, Father, that we might live fruitful lives for you. We do that by your grace and we can enjoy your grace and experience it because of the work of your son. We thank you for him and it's in his name we pray. Amen.